Everybody knows that farming in Africa is often a real challenge, right? The climate in most of the continents is a nightmare. You have to focus on just staying alive. Then there's the Sahara, always spreading its sand, ruining crops, and on top of that, the desert keeps expanding, turning land that's already barely usable into a dry, lifeless wasteland. Who's the luckiest of them all? The ones farthest from the Sahara, those whose territories sit in a somewhat decent climate, and Namibia. They found a legal cheat to make infertile land thrive. Seaweed. Time to figure out what this coastal African country has come up with. Seaweed isn't what you'd call a classic solution, but in Namibia, there's no way around it. Farming here demands some pretty unconventional approaches. This map gives you an idea of how rainfall is spread across the country. Sure, some places get so much rain that even farmers from the best agricultural regions would envy them. But that's way up north and in the northeast. And even then, only in a tiny area. There are some regions that aren't as lucky but still get their fair share of rain. Those marked in green get between 12 and 20 inches annually. However, most of the country is made up of areas where rainfall is a huge problem. Just take a closer look at that strip stretching along the western and southern coasts. This is where they filmed Mad Max Fury Road, and if you thought while watching that the landscape looked as lifeless as possible, well, you were right. This is the Namib Desert, one of the harshest places on Earth. Over 1,200 miles along the Atlantic coast of Namibia, Angola, and South Africa get no more than 0.08 inches of rain a year. You could say this is the most desert-like desert of them all. Even in China's Gobi, they get about 8 inches of rain a year on average, but here it's 100 times less. I wonder if those greenery-loving Chinese could handle such harsh terrain. The sand dunes here can reach up to 980 feet in height and stretch for 20 miles. By the way, there's actually a ranking of deserts based on dune size, and the Namib Desert's dunes take second place after Bedain Jiran in China. The temperature by the shore is pretty comfortable. It stays between 48 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you forget it's a desert, the conditions aren't that bad. But the farther inland you go, the worse it gets. In summer, it shoots past 113 degrees Fahrenheit, and at night, it's freezing cold. On top of that, desert sand gets easily blown away by the wind, so farming is out of the question both in the desert itself and anywhere near it. Well, technically, you could grow those quirky local endemic plants that sprout just a few leaves throughout their whole life, but there's not much use for a plant like that, so that doesn't change anything. The land is still unfit for any kind of farming. The desert doesn't cover all of Namibia, but that doesn't make things any easier. Only 2% of the land has enough water for growing crops. How are things with the rivers? Almost all of them are temporary waterways. That means they only have water when there's enough rain, and since there's not much of that, these rivers are usually nothing more than dry, useless valleys. To put it simply, growing anything here is a challenge. But we're not saying that nothing is grown in Namibia. They have sparse agriculture, which supports about 25 to 40 percent of the population. However, this population keeps growing despite the fact that the amount of fertile land isn't increasing and the growth rate is far from small. The country's population grows by about 2% a year on average. So it's clear that we need to expand the area of fertile land and plant more crops. What could help in this situation is located in a very unusual place not far from the shore where there are huge sand dunes of the Namib Desert. There's a cold Benguela current, rich in nutrients, perfect conditions for growing, macrocystis. In plain terms, these are seaweeds, giant kelp. That's exactly what kelp blue started cultivating, setting up their farm in the waters off a dry and arid country. Thanks to the local conditions, kelp is thriving, the Benguela current keeps upwelling, and the coastal waters get plenty of sunlight. As a result, kelp blue has cultivated a whopping 74 acres of seaweed, and they're not stopping there. The farm expands by 10 acres every month. This is thanks to both the hard work of the team and the kelp itself, which in the cold, nutrient-rich waters can grow up to 24 inches a day. This kind of farm isn't just about planting seaweed and leaving it be. The team checks on the seaweed regularly and keeps track of biodiversity using different methods. Acoustics, visual monitoring, water sample analysis, and environmental testing. All of this helps them understand the current growing conditions for kelp and figure out what can be improved to make it grow better. The result is a fast-grown seaweed of perfect quality which goes to Namibia. There, it's used to make compost and then grow plants in conditions where it would be impossible without the help of seaweed. Here's how it works. A plant is planted in infertile, unsuitable soil. 
There aren't enough nutrients for it to grow, so the crops grow more slowly and produce fewer fruits. In the end, continuous farming in such conditions only makes things worse. The soil becomes even less fertile. Chemicals might help, but they could also ruin everything. Plants in the poor soils of Namibia would lose even more of their ability to survive or might die altogether, and even if they don't, chemicals often cause various diseases in people who eat the fruits of these plants. Kelp contains all the essential macro and micro elements for plant growth, which means you need way fewer chemicals, plus it helps plants grow even in really harsh conditions. And when it comes to cost, seaweed is way cheaper than chemicals. What about Namibia's biggest issue, lack of water? Kelp compost helps with that too. As seaweed decomposes, it boosts the activity of plant cell walls, helping regulate water flow between crops and the environment. As a result, plants handle dry spells better, plus this kind of fertilizer makes it easier to deal with heat waves and soil salinity, environmental factors that are also not unusual for Namibia. Besides that, kelp as a fertilizer helps plants grow stronger and deeper roots because it mimics oxen-like effects. Oxen, by the way, is a plant growth hormone, so kelp is basically like a booster for crops. A well-developed root system holds onto nutrients and water better, perfect for Namibia with its not-so-fertile lands. There are great examples like grapes. Using kelp boosted nitrogen pathways by 200% and increased calcium mobility by 3.5% by activating microbes and growing populations of various organisms. And you can see the result for yourself. The grapes are bigger. And this is wheat with yields that went up thanks to using seaweed as fertilizer. And in this case, the more kelp, the better the results. There's also barley, which has become more productive in the same way. In this case, first the weight of a thousand grains increased by 3% compared to competitors grown without this kind of fertilizer. Second, the seaweed caused overall yields to rise by a whole 30%. And here's the corn. The plots with the crop that got the seaweed fertilizer did way better in terms of average plant height. It reached 38 inches compared to just 24 inches for those grown without kelp. The ear diameter also increased, hitting 7 inches instead of 6. But the most important factor is the yield. That went up too. The plot with kelp produced 37 pounds of harvest, which is more than twice as much as the 16 pounds from the plot without seaweed. And finally, watermelons. As you can see, the one on the right is way bigger than the one on the left. The right one was carefully monitored by scientists, and in the end, it grew to be 18 inches long. The yield from a certain plot turned out to be 107 pounds compared to 72 pounds without fertilizer. So off the coast of Namibia, there's a real solution to the agricultural crisis, something that makes already planted crops more efficient and even turns barren lands into places where something useful can actually grow. Actually, these neighbors growing near the shore are pretty useful even without making it onto land. If no one picked them and pulled them to the surface, giant kelp would make a great addition to the local waters. Giant kelp is famous for its impressive size. Growing up to 147 feet, it's literally an underwater forest. Just like on land, a forest is always a hot spot of biodiversity, so kelp forests become a vital habitat for all sorts of marine creatures, including fish, invertebrates, and other seaweed. It's both a forest and a refuge. Marine creatures get everything they need. Seaweed can help not just in farming and creating shelter for fish, but in many other ways too. Namibia doesn't even need to look beyond the continent to see that. Let's move to Kenya, where seaweed also plays a big role. This is the coastal village of Mozaro, where people used to make a living mainly by growing cassava and maize. Then came the drought, wiping out everything they'd planted, so they thought they live by the sea, so why not try farming seaweed? There weren't many other options anyway. They started planting seaweed along the shore, then harvesting it and laying it out to dry away from the water. By 2008, seaweed farming had expanded to as many as 20 villages. Then the World Bank stepped in and thanks to Kenya Coastal Development, things took a turn for the better. A processing plant was built to handle the seaweed. This added more value to seaweed products since now, right, Kenya, they could turn marine plants into soap, shampoo, hair products, shower gel, and body lotion. People in the country are limited in many things that would make life more comfortable, and sometimes even the most basic necessities aren't available. That's where seaweed-based products come in, as they can cover a variety of needs. Plus, they're edible, which is a big deal for Kenya. They make a powder that's used in food. 
Later on, along with the existing factory, the coastal villages got a drying facility to handle large amounts of harvested seaweed, which helped reduce post-harvest losses. Yes, the number of racks is limited because there's only one drying facility, not too many racks, and several villages harvest seaweed at the same time. Is that a problem? Not at all, since there's always the option to dry the seaweed right under the sun. In 2022, Kenya's seaweed industry produced nearly 100 tons of seaweed, bringing in over $30,000. Some of it was exported to China, France, the U.S., and other countries, giving locals and the country a chance to make some money. This is especially important for Kenya as it's not exactly rich in resources, or take neighboring Tanzania as an example. Their seaweed farming is actually the third largest export industry in the country. Almost 90% of marine exports are seaweed, and marine plants are the third biggest source of income. About 25,000 farmers work in the industry. Can you imagine how helpful this is for a country struggling with job shortages and unemployment? And we almost forgot to mention that a seaweed farm is a great way to capture carbon dioxide, at least for Namibia. Kelp grows fast. We got that from the first part of the video. But how? The answer is simple, photosynthesis, meaning it feeds on sunlight, plus kelp pulls carbon and nutrients from the surrounding water, storing them in different parts of itself, like the stalks, leaves, and everything else. After being absorbed by the kelp, some of the carbon turns into dissolved organic carbon, while some becomes solid organic carbon. The first kind either gets eaten by microbes right away or drifts into the ocean, sinking to the bottom. And you know, that's perfect for carbon storage because people hardly ever interfere with things deep down there, so the risk of it getting released is really low. Experts say that in this case, the carbon stays locked away for over a hundred years. Solid organic carbon, along with bits of seaweed visible to the naked eye, drifts away into the ocean for thousands of miles. Eventually, it too sinks to the bottom where, just like the first type of carbon, it stays for a long time. Basically, you get the idea. Seaweed is great at trapping CO2, but that's probably more useful for a country like China where there are thousands of dirty industries and all kinds of stuff that eco-activists can't stand. Do they actually need it here in Namibia? Actually, when it comes to this, things aren't too bad for this South African country. But Namibia has been mining diamonds for the past 40 years, and it's one of the country's leading industries. Over this time, diamond mining has contributed more than 60% of the real GDP from the entire mining sector. In 2022, a company called Deb Marine Namibia popped up in the country, also mining diamonds, but instead of digging in quarries, they do it out in the open sea. Over the year, the company hit a record production of 1.725 million carats, boosting overall diamond output by 45%. So you see what I mean, right? In a situation like this, where mining happens right nearby, seaweed can seriously help cut down the negative impact. Namibia is heavily involved in uranium mining, so much so that it stands as the world's fourth largest producer. In 2020, the southern African country produced 11% of the global uranium supply, making it the second biggest producer after Kazakhstan. All uranium extraction takes place at just two mines, Langer Heinrich and Rossing, which are believed to be capable of delivering 10% of the world's uranium. These mines are also the top sources of carbon pollution. In general, there are sources of pollution in the country, so an algae farm as a CO2 savior doesn't look too bad. However, one concentration of kelp won't be enough. So if the country ever aims to save itself from air pollution through kelp, it'll need to increase the number of water farms. How else can seaweed help Namibia and other countries? It can save them from another type of pollution, plastic. Yes, the country isn't a major source of plastic waste like some densely populated developing Asian nations. Still, the problem does exist. In 2024, the team from the Namibian Youth Chamber of Environment headed to the beaches stretching from Walvis Bay to Tora Bay. They found an enormous amount of trash washed up on the shore, everyday household waste, discarded industrial materials, plastic in all shapes and sizes. It was all present on the beach areas and in such huge quantities that it took the team a full three weeks to clean it all up. And this isn't the only initiative of its kind. Several cleanup campaigns take place throughout the year in various coastal cities of Namibia, organized by the Ministry of Environment, Municipalities, and the private sector. Gotta give credit to the Namibian authorities as they completely banned all single-use plastic bottles by January 2025, and back in 2024 they'd already outlawed plastic straws. But honestly, there have been so many similar initiatives worldwide, you couldn't even count them all. Do they help? Not really, since the population keeps growing and so does the amount of trash, no matter how many bans are in place. 
That's where seaweed could actually come to Namibia's rescue, just like in many other countries. For example, Australia's Flinders University, together with the German company One5, has developed a new eco-friendly coating material made from seaweed. The goal is to replace plastic coatings used in fast food packaging. The thing is, these days it's usually made from synthetic polymers derived from oil like polyethylene or polypropylene. None of this breaks down naturally, so it just crumbles into tiny bits microplastics. Researchers have suggested swapping synthetic polymers for a material made from sodium alginate. It comes from seaweed and is usually used as a thickening agent, gelling agent, or stabilizer. A few simple chemical tweaks to boost grease and oil resistance and here you go. A new material can hold fast food for a certain period. Obviously, you're not going to see this in Namibia anytime soon, and the country isn't exactly a major plastic polluter either. But if the idea of improving farming conditions with seaweed catches the attention of local authorities and they decide to scale up aquatic farms, then why not?